Hey everyone, Cam with Hope to Canine Foundation. This week we're going to start out talking about resource guarding and dogs, only the nature of the question came in around off-leash parks and beach areas and dynamics where, you know, uh, do you want to play fetch with your dog, but you've got other dogs around and how do you correct your dog and, you know, mitigate issues of resource guarding or possession or are you creating it inadvertently? in that case. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're also going to talk about, hello, Alexis and Nancy. Hi guys. Welcome in. We're also going to talk about, um, a behavior case that I was consulted about recently. And I want to share some reflections with you there. Sorry, I'm trying to get comfy and take a layer off, but now I can't seem to get my arm out of the sleeve. Um, because this was a really, really difficult case. Very, very, um, emotional, hard case. And, um, I really want to try to, um, not just, not just help somebody else and, and make that situation count, but really honor the life of this dog. Because, um, I think if we don't look at it, if it doesn't, um, serve to educate and help somebody else, then we're doing a disservice to that animal. So welcome. Thank you so much. Krista, you're so sweet. Thank you. I washed it. <laughs> That's what happens when you wash your hair, it gets big. And then I spend all of this energy flipping it around, trying to get out of my face the whole time we're talking because I can't stand having hair in my face. So stupid what, what we do, it's so stupid. Um, but thank you very much, I appreciate that compliment immensely. It grows like a weed, I've cut it a million times and still, nevertheless, it persists. Um, all right, guys, so as I said, we're gonna talk about a um, couple, couple things that came up this week, question that was sent in, um, and then anything that you would like to throw at me today, I will be happy to tackle as well within this next 60 minutes together. Um, definitely have a, a challenging dynamic when you're asking about issues of resource guarding and wanting to be able to have your dog take a toy or a ball to an off-leash area there's a high prevalence of um, conflict that's going to exist there because the sheer nature of having your dog chase the ball is to put them in prey drive, it's to put them in drive, okay? And we talk a lot about this, right? How dogs have inherent drives. You need to learn to read your dog's drive correctly. Some of this is very predictable and expected with certain breeds. Um, you know, talking about uh, shedding earlier uh, when I posted, you know, that excessive shedding is a big red flag, that there might be a health issue, that the diet's not balanced correctly, that there's something missing from the dog's diet. Um, the, you know, predictability of, of shedding, however, in certain breeds exists, right? If you don't want a shedding dog, then you don't go get a Husky or a Shepherd or a Labrador or some of these other ones. Uh, even, even small little terriers can be major shedders. Boston Terriers, Pugs, Pugs are terrible shedders, okay? So this is predictable, this is known. There is a balance that is within the range of normal and excessive amount is, is a problematic red flag that there's something wrong and this is true with drive, okay? But if you have a dog in drive, you are automatically telling them, asking them, encouraging them, hey Hannah, we're talking about your question, good timing. Automatically talking about um, telling that dog in drive that this is the time, this is the environment, this is the circumstance under which I want you to bite, bark, hunt, dig, whatever the case may be, okay? So if we put a dog in drive, and that's what happens when we do the ball uh, you know, activity, chasing the ball, throwing the ball. If we put a dog in drive, we have to have a level of respect and responsibility and understanding that redirected drive is a risk there, okay? Now, when we're working with a dog on protection training and we want that dog in defense drive or prey drive, it's kind of a combination of the two, when we're working with that animal in a controlled environment to train them to bark and hold and effectively identify the bad guy and you know threaten them and then go after them on command or at an appropriate time when the bad guy is threatening us, when that dog goes into defense drive to take action on taking that bad guy out or bringing them down, redirecting that drive and biting somebody, you know, redirecting, biting the handler or biting the wrong area of the decoy happens all the time, okay? It happens all the time. That's why there's a significant level of training that goes into really good decoy work so that they know that that is an animal, that is a predatory animal that is in drive and 
it's a fair game essentially, right? The training is to teach the dog where and how hard and how long to, to bite and hold, but that doesn't mean you aren't gonna get uh, a whole hell of a lot of spectacular bruises or you know scars to show for your decoy work because of that redirected um, you know aggression essentially, that redirected drive, okay? Doesn't mean the dog, okay, well, let me take a sip because I don't need to go down that path too much further. Mm -hmm. You guys know how I love to make a cup of tea or coffee and then never drink it on my streams. So if we're going to take that dog, we're going to put them in drive, which is what the ball thing is. It's why as a, as a trainer, when someone comes to me and is complaining about issues that maybe are core rooted in a drive, a lack of fulfillment for their dog. Okay. German shepherd, it's leash reactive. It's, you know, territorial it barks out the window I'm looking out because I'm sitting at my in my office window looking at my driveway um you know it's it's barking at everything that happens around the house it's reactive to the door knocks when Amazon comes by it's you know freaking out when company comes in when we start to talk to an owner in that situation and they say you know well the dog doesn't really go anywhere we go in the backyard and we play ball after work in the evening my schedule's really shitty. I don't have a ton of time. You know, we live in an apartment. The dog, you know, goes on a couple of walks for bathroom breaks. But because of the reactivity, for example, I can't take him anywhere. This is a classic domino spiral that takes place where things only get worse and compound because we have an unsatisfied drive. So when you take that dog out to throw the ball and you figure, okay, the field down the street at 10 p.m. when nobody's there and we'll do the ball game, that is a drive outlet that's very disconnected from you. That's why I don't love it, okay? Yeah, Monica, I was like, I walk my dog when there's nobody around, I can't see anybody, and yeah. So it's a compounding issue though because now you really don't have control or freedom or opportunities, right, with that dog because you've had avoidance of those situations and then things get worse. So we don't wanna put a dog in, uh, into that, that type of activity and that type of expression of drive when then we don't have a relationship that is built in a healthy and credible way with a human. You feel me? Like the very first thing we need to do is we need to take that drive and we need to harness it into an outlet that includes you, okay? Ideally, we don't have a prey drive dog going after a ball and becoming compulsive and obsessive about that and disconnected from you and then able to be possessive of that ball, right? All these things that become imbalanced. We want them to actually engage in a prey drive activity that both balances the leadership and you know relationship dynamics so that you're credible and gives them the chance to get the yayas out of their system for who and what they are. Bear with me one second because I hear a little squeaker. I'm gonna get a remote collar. today. This is how you do it though, you see? I can set uh, I can set this example for you and go, this is how you do it. You do your life and you train your dog. Okay. Um, hey Desiree, good to see you. So back to my story about an excessively long demonstration of the ball thing. Um, you're sending the dog out into drive you really want that to be a partnered activity. Now you're the source of the good feeling they get when they get to release those um, chemicals in their body that feel so good to them to do the thing that they're designed to do. And you're also asking them for impulse control when you structure it in the context of barn hunt or earth dog or agility or uh, you know protection training, tracking, right? All of these different activities that exist to give that dog that physical, mental, you know, overall genetic outlet for their drive. Now you become credible and relevant in that process. Herding, all of these great things, right? H-E-R-D, herding is an amazing outlet for a dog that loves to herd, that needs to get that out of their system. When you're involved in that activity as a means of communicating cues and controlling, we're on, we're off, we're on, we're off. Dial it up, dial it down, right? This is why I don't love fetch. I don't play fetch with my dogs. The extent of fetch that I play with my dog, and my dog is totally into the ball, you guys, totally and completely into the ball. Anyone who knows him that's hung out at my house will know that if he finds one in the toy basket or under the couch, he always finds them under the couch. He's never wrong when he tells me there's one there. When he finds the ball, he will absolutely self, you know, entertain endlessly with the dang thing. He'll roll it under the cot, 
He'll pounce on the cot, do CPR, retrieve the ball, roll it back under, start again. I mean, he's absolutely obsessed. He loves the ball, but I don't play fetch with my dog because he doesn't need any assistance becoming more and more compulsive about it. And that's not an activity that has the level of partnership that I want and the level of impulse control um, and challenge that I want him to have. It becomes really easy, okay? You take the ball out in the field, you take the ball to the beach, throw it back and forth, you have OCD, and then you have a level of easy that exists for your dog that then caps you on some of the development that you could experience and the mental brain challenge that we're looking for um, that exists when you train, when you are working on a skill set um, in some of these other activities and sports and, and things that we could be doing with our dog that have a higher ceiling of challenge potential, okay? So the question coming in from Hannah was, you know, my dog uh, has training, I have control, I've taught her that I can, you know, tell her to leave the ball and come back to me on command if another dog is approaching. I have done, uh, so I'm literally describing Charlie, yeah, no assistance hanging out with the ball. I know boxers tend to naturally have that for sure. And, and frankly, that's a really good cue that it's like you have massive obsession around, you know, this experience of drive and chase and hunting and um, all of those things, but when it comes to the ball, it gets neurotic, right? And it lacks control and it lacks balance. Um, so I do not play fetch with my dog. It, it may be like a rare thing that I take, you know, the big, big we have a big old um, jolly ball out back. I might take that and send it out into the yard just to get him to do a lap back up again um, as a distraction for, for another dog or, um, you know, there's scenarios where it's acceptable every now and then to work it in, but it's like, I don't play fetch with my dog and I don't go out and use the chuck it to throw the ball over and over again for my dog. So Hannah has control of her dog, but because they live in an apartment, their only uh, large field socialization opportunities are going to be those dogs allowed common areas, right? Taking the ball to the beach and having her dog love and become obsessed with doing that activity um, while having control over a dog you would think is ideal. And yes, it's an option. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, your dog loves to do it. It's easy for you. It gets her some good exercise. Fine. The problem is you aren't being fair around the component of not being able to control other dogs and the presence of that other stimulus and having your dog in drive in that context. You are controlling uh, that drive. You are being responsible with that drive when you have your dog uh, you know, in a class working on protection skills, for example, and there are other dogs present. They have to learn to ignore one another and respect each other's space. Um, while connecting with a handler and following obedience command and learning to turn that defense and, and um, you know, prey drive on and off, okay? So it's why I prefer it. It's not, um, you know, tug would be another thing, right? Like you go to a big open field, you take a nice walk around or, or, or the off-leash beach that you go to, you take a nice walk around, no toy or ball included. Your dog is able to come in and out of the water, in and out of interaction with other dogs. You have control, you're responsible, you've trained your dog so you can call her out of situations that might be problematic. But then you go over and you find your little corner of the world where there's nothing going on and you bring your little tug, right? You bring your little bite, you know, sleeve or pillow or tug or whatever and start engaging in some of these activities of turning on and off and having your dog um, work at the sleeve and then go into some obedience routines. And if you do a, you know, a sequence of this, right? Like you are more important in the context of this drive expression and fulfillment um, and in the conversation of impulse control than if you're doing uh, fetch with a ball, okay? This is, this is why there's such an argument for there being more uh, quality energy outlet and drain and fulfillment in that activity because it's harder. It has more challenge to it, okay? Um, but the, the deeper question here was, you know, uh, other dogs that are not trained, uh, or not taking good social cues or owners that don't care. Some dogs will try to take the toy from my dog. It's a risk of a fight. I don't care how well trained your dog is. It's a risk of a fight. Okay. It's, it's a resource, you know, that she has been taught that she possesses by way of the repetition of retrieval and that it's just yours. Okay. Um, and she'll correct them with a growl or a bark. She's not wrong, but she could get her ass kicked. She could do that with the wrong dog and it could be a 100% dog fight on your hands. 
Usual steps are to throw the ball away from other dogs and immediately out, which is the like stop, back away, never mind command, to drop the ball when another dog approaches. Now, that's literally, in my opinion, the only option you have if you're going to continue to push the envelope in this case. So off-leash dog in a large field beach scenario where dogs are allowed and everyone's off leash and running around and doing whatever it is that they want and you know you've attracted you know in those environments a lot of people who have no control whose dogs are brats and douche canoes and they don't have any you know uh care in the world for ha holding their dog accountable how do i get Gotti to be more aggressive with the tug oh great question joe i'll come back to that um, and I love that you're playing tug with him still. That's awesome. I know Carrie Ann found that to be a good motivator for him. Um, so you're still, you're up against the fact that you've got a plan for the lowest common denominator, right? And the person who is also going to freak out if your dog corrects their dog. There's lots of you out there. Oh my God, your dog's, you know, bit at my dog. It's like, yeah, because they, you're having a conversation, you know, your puppy or your dog is being rude. You know, they're being, they're sticking around too long, they're up or butt and they didn't buy her a drink. I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios where people are really, really uneducated about how to interpret dog behavior. And they're extremely anxious and defensive and insecure about dogs correcting each other. Nature corrects, guys. It's the same issue we run into when we're trying to help you eliminate behavior problems and be credible and valuable leaders uh, to your dogs. You must correct. You have to share corrections. Sometimes the correction is just the withholding of their resources. It's leveraging food. It's leveraging affection. You don't, you don't realize sometimes it doesn't have to be about, you know, prong collars and e-collars and leash corrections and, and you know restriction in the crate. Those are things that become more and more valuable and effective the longer you create a problem that you know that you've built up with your dog. The more in the weeds you are with your dog's behavior, those things become just no brainer, the most effective, fastest way to start creating an overhaul and changing the message that you share with that animal and or delivering information in a timely and clear way that they understand and feel good about being able to respond to and navigate. But if you're doing things right from the beginning, and this is why we have Raising a Rockstar, the puppy group, because we really want people to understand, hey, puppies, dogs, predators are motivated by three major things, food, mating, and migration. All right, how they socialize and interact and get, you know, resources from the pack, the food itself, the, the you know, opportunity to eat and get water and, uh, you know, how they uh, move through the world, how they what, what they get to experience in terms of using their nose, exploring, um, you know, scenting, hunting, etc. So if you're not leveraging those things from early on, you've given them all away for free. Your dog gets a bowl of food whenever they want it, twice a day, no matter what, even if they were a dick that day. If you're taking your dog through the world on migration, pulling at the other end of a leash, sniffing, smelling, peeing wherever they want, reacting to whatever, they have no direction, there's no structure, there's no accountability and, and parameters within the community about how that should look and who goes first and so on and so forth. Um, you're really, really, really missing out, right? So, you know, my, my ultimate bottom line here is for Hannah's question, which is a great question. You have a dog that you can take out and do these things with because you did your due diligence in training and putting off leash control. So great. You are taking a risk of bringing the ball into that environment, okay? I wouldn't bring it into that environment. I wouldn't do it. With my dog, I wouldn't do it. Period. I would only bring that ball out, and you're, I think you're hitting on it now, as a reward at the end of that exercise. Ball's usually the reward for trick and obedience because she doesn't like food. Definitely going to keep the toys on the empty be yeah, to the empty beach days. Not worth the risk. Bingo. That's how I would look at it. Um, or, you know, move away to go to the area where there's nobody around. Boom. Spike that ball. She wins. She gets to have it. Couple retrieves. You're done. And honestly, restriction from it is only going to build motivation and desire for it. That is how we get the dog to bite harder, to hold longer. That possession is built by frustration and restriction. Okay? So 
If um, we come back to Joe's question, uh, he was asking, how do I get Gotti to be more aggressive with the tug? Joe, can you describe for me your current dynamic of how you engage in this game with him? Is it something you're doing, like how frequent, for how long, and what do you do with your tug, whatever it is that you're using for that purpose, in between play? Where do you store it? How is it, What? where is it hanging out? What do you do with it? Can you give me some of those details? That would be really helpful. Um, so does that make sense? You guys, this is helpful. Anybody else have questions about that? The, the whole like ball at the off leash area. Cause a lot of you are limited and you want to be able to run your dogs and let your dogs sniff and explore and socialize. And if they have varying degrees of ability to do that with other dogs safely, um, you know, you're heading in those areas and environments wanting to create a positive result, but you're also taking a calculated risk. And you need to mitigate that risk by not taking your dog in drive, right? Just neutrality. Let them just dog. No dog on time in that case because it's prime real estate for a fight. Barn hunt opportunities in San Diego rally and agility have been amazing. Yeah, I want to do barn hunt also and they are supposedly in Oceanside. Supposedly, there's an option in Oceanside. Now... Stay in touch with me, Hannah, because she will. Um, my breeder, my Glenn breeder, Anne Marie, um, who's in the Rockstar group, by the way. So post in there if you have questions about it. She's an AKC judge for Barn Hunt. So I know you're in the group. You can post in there and ask, you know, hey, Aunt Anne Marie Pember, talk to me about Barn Hunt in San Diego. Where do we go or how do we get it here? Um, because that conversation has been something I've been circling back to her about for a little while and we've never gotten her down here to actually do like a clinic, but she's thinking of being able to be here potentially in April, this April. Um, and so maybe we'll be able to overlap it to a barn hunt clinic out of Hope to Canine. Um, but I believe there's a club or there's a group doing it out of Oceanside. No. Do your work, dogs. Um... What else did I miss? I'm waiting for Joe to let me know. Hang on one second while he's answering me back. <laughs> no, Wonderful to use a back tie. Raise your hand if you installed a back tie. <laughs> um, really, 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 really handy to have. Yeah, no problem, Hannah. Um, Anne Marie is awesome and she loves to talk barn hunt, scent work, working dog. I mean, she's such a great resource and she's in that group and it's a really, really cool opportunity um, actually for you that you're in the Raising a Rockstar group and bumping up alongside some of these pro professionals that I'm bringing in there because, um, you know, great, great info. Yeah. Stephanie, back tie. Whoop. Okay. Joe, he only gets tug time twice a day as an exercise. He seems to get tired fast. It's too many times. Okay. So, Joe's question, in case you didn't catch it earlier, everyone, was how do I, you know, build more um, engagement with the tug? How do I get him to be more aggressive with the tug? You restrict it. So um, what that tells me is that you're doing other things that are fun for him or draining for him. And he has um, a lack of motivation that that's the only thing that he's going to get to do within that day. And that's the only time that he's going to be able to um, express this side of himself. So we actually need to restrict it. We need to decrease the amount of time that he's even coming out of the crate, probably. Can you tell me, Joe, I have a suspicion that he's hanging out out of his crate more often, probably these days, than he was, for example, in board and train specifically. Um, and, you know, I would love to know a little bit more about what your routine is. Um, at this stage in the game. He trained with Carrie Ann a few months back, I think, right? Maybe it's been a while longer now. But um, I would restrict it. I would, I would look at him. If you want to build that, you've got to look at him as a working dog. And working dogs are actually put up for a whole lot of the day. And they only come out for a super short little window, five, ten minutes sometimes. 
We do some, you know, sequences uh, to build that tug drive, to build that bite intensity. And then we end it before they do. We wanna actually end the exercise before the dog shows you that they're over it or that they're tired. So how long would you say a session usually is? You say he gets tired fast, but what does that mean to you? Five minutes, 20 minutes. This is good for a lot of you guys because you need to, uh, many of you need to offer your dogs more appropriate drive fulfillment outlets. I just shared that post, common canine, um, common ground canine, sorry. Um, so spot on guys that you need, you know, we say a lot like your dog needs a job to do, but it doesn't mean a whole lot to many pet owners. And that job is, you know, really just about, um, you know, the, the, pred the predatory nature in your dog. What is the way that it's naturally inclined to express it? Um, the reason that things like barn hunt are so amazing, and if you're unfamiliar with what that is, it's where you're teaching your dog to go through hay bale mazes and identify where rats are in tubes. And then it's a partnered activity. The handler needs to learn to read their dog correctly in order to call out that there are, that the dog has identified where some rats are. Um, earth dog would be the dog has to do an above ground tracking and go below ground into the tunnel where the rat is at the end in a cage and then work the cage, right? So show a commitment that they found it and they wanna get it. Um, these different activities are really well suited for dogs that have braid drive, for dogs that are, you know, um, that work the ground, that work their nose, that are accustomed to digging for vermin, you know, and their natural dynamic. Uh, a lot of these terriers, dachshunds, you know, our Glen of them all, um, they're really well suited for these activities. That's this, their natural genetic makeup, right? So this is a job. The job is that expression of drive. It's to say, this is where you can bite, bark, lunge, dig, hunt, you know, uh, defend. This is how I want you to express that. Not willy nilly in the house towards Aunt, Aunt Jen, okay? I don't know, I had a weird name come to mind I didn't wanna say. <laughs> Thought maybe his weight was a problem. He's hitting 90 at this time. He's hitting a fat 90 or he's just hitting a developed 90 pounds? It's not an issue. There are 130 pound dogs that do protection work. Your, your massive breed dogs, your kind of corso dogs that get absolutely enormous and they are ferocious uh, with well honed drive. Leave the house, he's only in his cage when you leave. Okay, so here's your answer, Joe. Um, life is too comfortable for Gotti now. Life is just too comfortable and he lacks motivation. And that doesn't surprise me just given how he's got dog buddies at your house, you know, you guys are around a lot. Um, some of his attitudinal issues previously had been stemming from freedom and access to things, right, that he hadn't earned. You now have the ability to navigate the conversation in an appropriate way. So you've managed that and you've eliminated, um, you know, a lot of those behavior issues and you're using tools that work for you to have a lifestyle of success together now when he's free and included but unfortunately, the, con the consequences coming out in this other area of a lack of motivation and the drive. So if you really want to hone his um, you know, defense drive and his bite and you want to promote him being more assertive with the tug game, which really truly is very good for the dog to be encouraged to do and to have that as an outlet. And it is a very exhausting activity though. So 10 minutes isn't surprising to me. Um, and this is what's so funny, like we know a lot of people will have their dog, remember we were talking about fetch at the top of the broadcast, the dog will go for an hour, right? Because it's not difficult. It's physically draining, but it isn't mentally draining. Tug is a totally different quality exercise outlet. And I know there are several other people on the stream who will be able to um, vouch for this that when they work their dog in strategic tug work, meaning they are giving their dog an outlet for their drive, for their defense drive, the fact that it's, you know, they have protection instincts or they have bite instincts, they want to rip and tear and, and pull and defend and, and have that outlet. When they work their dog in tug, 
Um, oh, thanks, Monica, for checking. I do believe there is another group. I'll just have to do a little bit more digging still. It, it's new. It's not been something that's been accessible down here. But, you know, when you do work your dog in Tug Joe, it is more exhausting. And a five or eight minute session is all that it often takes. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with him in that regard. The intensity with which he shows up to the party, though, and the um, quality of the bite is going to be something that you do build. You have to build it, especially if you have an animal that you've put a lot of control and obedience on early on. So if you're truly competitive in drive sports, you don't train your puppy. You don't train your, your dog early on to have an off switch. You don't teach them to be soft with their mouth, okay? You actually allow all that crazy and you just direct it, you guide it, you give it an outlet and you ignore when it's just, when it's getting set in the wrong direction, okay? I get my tugs from Learberg and um, I'll come back here, I think, let's see. Da, 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 da. Learberg and mer, mer, mer. I'm, gonna, I'm in my email, Sean, because I'm trying to look at um, the last uh, order I placed, and I wanted to tell you that company because it's not Leerberg. Come on, Cam. Mm -mm -mm. Um, how long should you tug with him? I would say five minutes. Do it for five minutes and then end it and put him in his crate. So when he's still engaging with you, you end it. The, like, the height, of, like he's like, yeah, this is great. And then you're like, and done. You want him to want more. You need to leave him wanting more. All right? Um, arm sleeve for tug and training, he's just not ready for it yet. You can get it. I mean, you just have a pet dog. It's not the end of the world. If you wanted to go and no, they're not fire hose material. They're more like jute, uh, Sean, as far as the material. Um... So, you know, a sleeve is going to be harder for Gotti. Uh, the, the, the progression to biting a sleeve for most pet dogs is about building confidence because it's more vulnerable. The dog has to be more confident um, to bite your arm, to bite your bicep, right, uh, than it does to bite your ankle. Think of it that way. This is much more confrontational and intimate. So this is also information that we know and look at and consider when someone has a dog that's bitten. We say, where? Where did they bite? How did they bite? Did they bite and flee? Did they bite and hold on? Did they bite uh, with the front teeth? Did they bite with the full mouth? Okay, because this tells us about confidence and intent. And you're looking at that in the context of tug. You're looking for that confidence to go up you're looking for intent and quality of the bite. And when you use something like a pillow or a flirt pole, you're able to mimic the prey a bit more, right? You wanna flop it and drag it and tease. And this promotes the dog wanting to chase and stomp and bite and hold, okay? As they gain confidence and they're consistent at that level, then you can start to add in things like arms because when your puppy was little you said don't do that now you're changing the rules remember i was talking about working dogs protection trained dogs we start very early saying it's okay to do this we don't shut that down we just restrict access so they're not out living in a normal home like you guys raising your pets uh where they're going to get themselves in trouble Right, And we want to build that energy so that when we pull them out to train them, they've got lots to give to that bite session. Does that make sense? So this is just a game for your dog and you're building confidence right now. And the confidence will come when you end when he's successful. You end early while he still wants more. And you, know, you keep uh, the duration really short and you do it less often. And then you can't do all the other stuff with him too, right? You've got to make this like the only time that he's getting that attention and engagement with you so that he's really queued up to figure out how to make the most of it, okay? Barnhunt.com. Oh, thanks, Anne-Marie, for chiming in on that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, COVID. Yeah, I would love to do a clinic in April. I really would. We've been talking about this ever since I moved here. So 
It's our birthday month, by the way, too. You all can bring us a cake. <laughs> Anne Marie and I have a birthday month. Uh, hard time just get tightened to latch onto a tug. Yeah. It's, um, it isn't interesting though, because he's a human reactive dog. Um, and it's, so it's really important. This is an important little note here, you guys, about why your dog is not always a good candidate for protection training simply because they're reactive to people. They might be chicken shit. <laughs> and then you go and you try to put them under pressure because that's what protection training is. It's like, activate your drive, engage your defense and your, and your prey tendencies, and then maintain that intensity under stress and pressure. Don't stop when the bad guy fights back, right? So we, we mimic those scenarios by using the, the sticks that you see. Like if you ever watch a video of a dog competing in protection, they, they deploy, they, they get the decoy, the decoy hits them with a the stick or mock hits them with the stick, fights, you know, tries to get them, yells at them. Your dog has to have a lot of confidence to do that work. If it's an insecure dog who's biting because they're insecure and neurotic and entitled, they're not gonna translate to a strong protection training dog. Will that be an outlet that gives them a place to direct the desire to bite? Yeah, it does. But it's not, you know, your dog is not appropriate for protection training. I want, to, I want my dog to be a protection dog simply because they're defensive at the doorway. They, those are not automatically one and the same at all. Very, very important to know that, okay? Um, so I think I answered everybody. Correct me if I'm wrong. I was trying to find, Sean, you can vox me because we coach privately. Um, remind me to look for you. There's another company I want to tell you about that I order stuff from. And I just can't think of the name right now. Um, I just cannot think of the name right now. But my favorite pillow I'll show you guys. All right, this is my favorite right here. Dun, da, da, da. It's like jute, okay? It's got handle here and here. I'll find the link and I'll post it or I'll have April add it later for you guys when I find it. So it's yay so big. It's about the size of my forearm, a little bit bigger, okay? And I love this one because you can flip it, flop it, flirt it, drag it. You know, the dogs um, that are new at all of this and trying to figure out, you know, what, what is it that we're going for? It's not too big. If you go straight to a sleeve, it's too big. That's, that's another answer for Joe. It's like the sleeve is just, it's too big, it's too bulky. If the dog isn't confident about the game and they don't understand the objective, what they do is they go try to grab the corner or they'll try to get, you know, whatever the thinner material areas are on the sleeve. And I have a giant sleeve, which my dog uses now, um, but this is our standby for funsies. You know, this is just an awesome tool that I can easily use as a reward. I can tuck it here and do obedience sequences and then boom, deliver it to him. Or I can put it like so and do obedience sequences and then bam, reward, okay? Um, yeah, so this is my favorite, highly recommend. I will get you guys some links. Um, and then as far as the flirt pull is concerned, good source for flirt pull or make myself. Yeah, you can make it yourself. Absolutely. You can also do something, um, for your guy actually, uh, like a spring pull, you know, I don't know if you've ever set one up in your past residences, um, but maybe in your new place where you are now, that would be a good thing to install. A spring pull is, um, going to be stationary you know, and vertical, but it's going to do the same thing, basically. Um, you can tease and flirt and you can also attach this to a spring pull and just have a quick release so that once the dog's latched and hanging, you come up and undo the clip and it drops and the dog wins. They get to possess it now, okay? So you can look up on YouTube, Susan. There's some tutorials and examples there on how to install Broke Our Friends. Yeah, so you need to make it nicer than they did. I don't know what they did, but you know, it has to be done correctly, obviously, for the right weight um, of the dog that's going to use it. They're not all created equal. Um, as far as a flirt pole, that's that's partly why I'm saying you should just go to a spring pole, 
personally, because your dog is really big and really strong. And unless he's just like really doesn't understand the tug concept, the flirt pole is the ground level intro to it. So if he broke your friend's spring pole, it tells me he put some muscle into that. Yeah. Or did he just destroy it? <laughs> um, if he puts some muscle into biting, hanging, you know, shaking, trying to get that, then you don't need a flirt pole. But you can get, you know, uh, you can get a great quality flirt pole. The, the best ones that I've learned over time are really with um, leather as the material. The, the floppy part is leather. You could do canvas too, but it's not, it's really ideal if it's leather, I think. They last longer, the dog can hold it. Yeah, you put muscle into it. I don't think you're at a flirt pole stage at all. I would skip to this. And then what you can do if you really wanna flirt with this is you just loop your leash through, right? Put your, your leash through its own handle and pull and just hold the buckle end. And then you can flirt with this. And then when he gets it, it's appropriate and substantial enough for a dog your size, your dog's size. Make sense? Cool, cool, cool. Um, did I miss anything else? Yeah, April validated my assessment. Um, complete chicken. So I wanna talk to you guys real quick. Uh, again, Sean, don't let me forget to get those links and then we'll share them with everybody here. Um, does it go into dirt or concrete? Hangs, it hangs. So if you have a good tree, you can do it from a, from a tree. If you want to install a pole, you know, off of the side of fence and have it overhang from there. The other option would be um, a frame, which a lot of uh, trainers like in GRC Sports are using the yoga trapeze frame actually to hang their spring pole from. There's some tutorials uh, out there on how to do that. Those yoga uh, trapeze frames are not cheap though. They're available on Amazon. You can order and build it yourself and have it in your homes, depending on how motivated you are. They work brilliantly if you're a club or a rescue and you can share it, you know, and you're gonna use it for a lot of people. Um, let me see if I can, uh, Amazon, da, da, da. There, uh, it's the perfect concept though, because your spring pole hangs from the top center there's plenty of clearance for the dog to go in and do what they need to do. And then you can also put the release clip on there so that the tug can be released and the dog can win. Um, Cause that's what you're looking for. You're looking for this back and forth conversation of getting that dog frustrated and motivated. Then they go after it, they bite hard, they hold, they work to get it and then they win. And it's like, whew, that felt really good. I really wanna do that. Again, yoga trapeze frame. Um, frogs. Can you hear my frogs, guys? They're so cool. Carrie Ann's favorite. These are not the ones we're looking for. Here we go, guys. All right. Let me show you this, okay? Do do do. Right here. Look at that price. What? But yeah, that's what lots of people are using. Yoga trapeze frame, okay? So... You got to either have lots of play money, I do not, or um, you share with friends, <laughs> right? We get it. You start a club. You start a bite work, bite, bite club. <laughs> First rule of bite club, everybody pitches in $5 to pay for the yoga trapeze. <laughs> uh, but if you can think of something else or you're a builder, you're, you know, um, you've got, you, you know, you're, if you're handy or you have a handy person, um, in your world that can mimic that concept, great. Figure out another way to create the same idea. But most people put their spring pole off a tree. You know, they get a really nice strong tree and they hang it from an impenetrable branch and then the dogs can tug and hang and, you know, engage with that all they want and it's stable, it's fine. I got a bunch of oak trees here. It works to have that type of a mechanism just mounted to the tree. If you don't have a tree, you're gonna have a little bit of a harder time, but maybe you have a deck frame, like um, I've seen that done as well. If you have an awning over your, you know, deck or patio or back area, and you can install something hanging off of one of those, that's another great way to do it. Just be mindful that there's clearance around, 
and that the dog, you know, that, it, that the height of it is such that it's safe and appropriate for your dog to be able to reach it and hang. And yeah, I don't think your palms are gonna work, no. Um, and then also, let's see here. Also, also a note about that, um, you know, that you have a way to hang it up so people aren't gonna walk into it because the spring pole is a giant metal spring. Like it's, it's not, um, you need to be able to flip it up and over or, or disconnect it if you're gonna put it in an area like that, okay? So um, before I run out of time, guys, I wanna just spend the last few minutes, um, and, and please holler if I missed anything, but um, I wanna spend the last few minutes just talking with you about a case that I had this week um, that you know is just really um, stuck with me. I, I feel a lot of empathy for this family and for what they're going through and you know the situation that they find themselves in, and I really want to utilize this platform to share their story in some way in the hopes that it will matter, that it will really count for something, what they're going through, because it's really painful. Um, you know, zero judgment, shame, or blame. They acquired a puppy from a breeder who was advertising on Craigslist, and um, it happened to be a bully breed, you know, pup. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, they have massive experience. Uh, the owner who purchased this puppy has tons of experience with this breed for years and years. Multiple generations of his family has had many, many, many of these dogs um, and, you know, rescued them, even bred, grandfather bred them. Um, for all intents and purposes, the assumption and expectation was, you know, this is just, I'm getting another dog. I'm getting a breed of dog that I'm familiar with and love. It's the frogs, if you can hear it. It's so loud. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be great. But of course, this is in the start of 2020 pandemic. And everyone in 2020 who's who got a puppy, uh, let alone who had an already, you know, separation anxiety prone dog or insecure dog, being avoidant of social experiences or not practicing interacting with other people coming into your home, for example. Um, all of these scenarios made everything worse for everybody raising their dogs. The limitation of, you know, training classes and, you know, having access to experiences in a developing puppy or to conditioning and proofing in an older dog. Um, we also are dealing with our dogs being exposed to our stress to what we're carrying through this experience of a pandemic, right? And of uncertain times politically. Um, there are a lot of aspects of stress that we're all dealing with in some way, shape or form. Unemployment, loss of housing. Uh, it, it could be, you know, just stressful family dynamics, having children home, homeschooling them or distance learning during this last year. These things are affecting our dogs, okay? So with all of that said, they had a perfect experience of their puppy for many months until all of a sudden one day that changed, just like that. And the dog was aggressive towards a child that had been hanging out around it all day long, playing, no big deal. All of a sudden that child passed by that dog and went to pet that dog on the head and that dog went after the child and did a full grip bite to the side of that child. Long story short, there have been multiple bites ever since then, and that was end of October. So November, December, January, the dog has a solid four bites on its record. It's severely reactive. Um, it has become a very different animal in the course of an, what felt like an overnight experience to this family. Now, I did an in-person assessment, and I personally believe that there is a genetic component at play here that is significant for a long-term management required and risk of the behavior worsening. I also uh, approach a situation like this with the belief that we have to do investigative work from a holistic standpoint to make sure there's no pain or chemical imbalance or an issue that is... Uh, medical in nature in some way, shape, or form. The dog may have an impingement. They may be chiropractically out of alignment and there could be, you know, neurological pain as a result of that. These are things we can't see that our dogs cannot tell us, right? The dog had a limp last year. They were going to x-ray and try to investigate what the cause was. It went away and then it came back again. This is information, right? It could be idiopathic in nature or it could be that it's related to something like I'm describing. Is there 
an overall systemic issue or a musculoskeletal problem that is contributing to this dog becoming defensive, becoming aggressive. Unfortunately, there was also some information that points to the relationship imbalance and the fact that the dog doesn't have a fundamental understanding of yes and no and respect of the space. He's become territorial because he's had too much freedom, too much affection. Um, the language in this case that was utilized were things like we were laying around and the dog was on his ottoman, okay? I have to point this out because I want you guys to be able to see this stuff in your own process so that we can prevent situations like this wherever possible. Your furniture is your furniture. It cannot be your adolescent dog's furniture if you want to prevent these issues from happening. And the reality is that these stories, whether genetic and you know, in, in, at the core or a combination of things, genetics were there and then the environment became ripe for the behavior to, to you know, show up. They consistently show up around the same age of eight or nine months to 12 months, somewhere in that six month range of eight to nine months forward is when we see these changes. Because as I shared in the Raising a Rockstar group this morning in more detail, the dog is matured with confidence. The dog is matured with certain belief systems. The dog has established certain understanding of who you are, relationship associations. Over that, the months that you've now had it, four or five months, is typically you get your dog at about eight weeks or so, right? Um, it's learned about you, about the environment, about a sense of, you know, whether or not it's getting what it needs, getting what it wants, and whether or not you follow through. So the real estate in this case is created by you to whether or not these behaviors are going to show up on the basis of that drive, temperament, disposition, or genetic makeup. I do not hold this family responsible for what behavior is now manifested in this dog exclusively because there's more to this story. There is much more going on here. The medical investigation that would have to be done would be extraordinary and the training investment that would have to be done would be extraordinary. And still there's no guarantee that they would get to the other side of this without a significant liability. This dog is biting its own family. This dog is aggressive towards its own family. That shouldn't be happening, okay? And it's very severe and it's a highly, highly powerful 100 pound dog. In this case, I recommended euthanasia personally um, especially on the basis of this person's experience with the breed and their desire to have a breed ambassador and to represent bully breed dogs in an appropriate way. There are too many good dogs out there to live with the level of fear and restriction that you have to live with when you commit to keeping a dog that's this severe and this intense and with so many question marks around it. It's a high risk that you run into this type of thing when you buy a dog on Craigslist. This is a reality that you all need to be aware of. Whether it's an aggressive large breed, you know, bully dog, or it's a crappy, sick, you know, difficult to potty train little multi-poo. When you get a dog off of Craigslist, it's not where your reputable breeders are hanging out. It's not where your, you know, intentional breed ambassador, reputable breeders who do genetic testing, who, who look at, hips and you know eyes and put lots of money into testing both parents before they create a litter into performance assessments and making sure that they have proven stock it's not where they're hanging out guys okay they're not hanging out on craigslist and they're not hanging out on internet you know puppy mill websites promoting that they'll ship their dogs to you from across the country so that's number one red flag Number two I want to bring up is really difficult for a lot of us. It's really painful for us to take responsibility for our stuff that our dog may be inadvertently responding to and having to carry and, and feel in the environment. Can the dog go to a canine officer? No. Totally inappropriate for that and I can come back to why. This actually relates to my prior comments about protection trained dogs that are um, unstable. So the, um, the, the 
information I was able to extract in this case with some strategic questions was actually that we were dealing with a family uh, or an ownership case where the owner's a veteran, the owner is um, currently on disability, young too, so bless him for everything he's given, um, and starting a new career. Now think about it, you guys. Think about it. If you've gone from serving our country and living through enough trauma to now have injuries and, and damage done to your body to the extent that you're on almost half-time disability and you're having to change paths and course correct to a different career choice and you're in school and it's a pandemic and you get a puppy, it's time to slow down and look at that stuff. There's grief there that hasn't been dealt with and now we have a dog in the mix that I think is actually just in part intended to help this person stop and actually sit with that stuff. And it may be hard to connect with. I do this all the time, so I see it every day. But, you know, the, the reality is sometimes we're just here to give permission about just how hard the situation is, just how untenable and unrealistic the situation is sometimes we're here to share accountability that the choices that were made and the match that exists is not a good one that the you know challenge that's coming down the pipeline is really serious and just how much it could cost you to keep at it it's really really difficult to you know want to sit with your trauma most of us don't want to do that right and then along, a lot of the times it takes something really painful and really difficult to force that hand. Um, I've been through many of those things myself in my life. You know, that, that humility that comes from upheaval and, and facing a lack of control only to have you then sit and really surrender to what it is that drives you to want to have control. That's tough. That's tough stuff. But it's also really beautiful if you accept that experience and you surrender to that process. So this is a difficult case, but I really, again, I, I really think that these lives matter immensely. They're not for nothing. And it isn't always about throwing a bunch of money at training and tools and resources and staying the course on management when it means you can't live your life and you still have a dog at the end of all of that that isn't a good representation of the breed. I really do think that's an important conversation for us to have, especially when you think, um, you know, perhaps ignorantly or disconnectedly that all dogs should and can be saved. Because there's a person behind that statement that has to, you know, give up a lot in their life, that can't move forward with their career because no one else can handle their dog that can't get insurance because they have a dangerous dog, that doesn't sleep well and makes themselves sick because they feel badly about having their life or the dog's life or both restricted on the basis of the behavior concerns, the health limitations, etc. These are things that we deal with on a regular basis when people reach out to us to surrender their dogs. This is a reason they're surrendering their dogs. Conflict between dogs, conflict between dogs and people, health issues they can't afford, the list goes on, all right? And no matter what the decision, the outcome is for you, if you find yourself in one of those situations where you have a difficult or dangerous dog, no matter what the situation or outcome is, I really want people to understand that the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do, whether you euthanize that animal or rehome that animal, is to listen to what that experience had to share with you. Listen to the message it's giving you about how your plate is too full, or you haven't slowed down to deal with your grief, or you haven't slowed down to take care of yourself first, or you're not paying attention to how the people in your life should come first. Listen to the message that that dog has for you when they are acting aggressively, reactive, severe separation anxiety. There is a catalyst opportunity here with that animal to point you in the direction of more balance and health. I guarantee it. If you'll listen, if you'll allow it, 
there is an opportunity for you to see where your process, the way you move through the world and how you deal with things, what the recipe is that you use to make decisions and operate day to day, unconsciously, more than consciously. There is a message about that. There's feedback from this situation with this difficult dog about your process, okay? And there's a hell of a lot of love here from our community for the people who dig in and hear that message and get to work doing everything they can to stay the course with their difficult dog because of what they'll learn along the way. Life throws difficult things at us. We can't always dump them and walk away and just take the easy road or we'll get another lesson that's even harder coming at us later. But sometimes <laughs> these are circumstances beyond your control that are just too dangerous and you've had enough information, you've been getting enough messages, you have enough permission that it is not a tenable, appropriate situation to continue with. Why put yourself in the hole? This is a person we did not, we would not take money from. We are not going to work with this dog. Why put yourself in the hole for potentially eight to $10,000 only to end up on the other side with an animal that is that dangerous? Okay, these situations do exist, you guys, and this is why you need to be careful and you know conscientious about where you source your dogs and how you begin your process and who you are in that process. Because all of this stacked up to a very tearful, painful, difficult outcome for this family and was never their vision or intention. Never their vision or intention, all right? Um, the canine officer question regarding dogs who, who are aggressive, who bite, uh, that is the last place you want a dog like this because it's a massive liability now, not just to a private individual, but to an entire uh, agency. Dogs that go into law enforcement and military work need to be highly controllable. They need to be able to be deployed at the right time for the right reasons and disengage on command. This is a dog that's short-circuiting. This is a dog that is not wired right. One of the things this dog does is bruxate. So we've talked about this in the past. I'm gonna run out of time here, but really quickly, that is a behavior that also indicates that there's something off. Something isn't right neurologically, chemically. Again, that investigatory work that would have to be done from a medical standpoint is pretty significant financially. And they still, on the other side of that, would need training. And they still, on the other side of all that, would be looking at management because this dog is biting its family. And it's very, very powerful dog. Very powerful dog and big intent, in, you know, bites with intent, okay? Um, so there's an instability there that's inappropriate for professional work. Law enforcement buys dogs for thousands of dollars to have that reliability that this is a this is a weapon that is highly tuned and you know appropriate to be out in public letting people pass by it in the airport imagine if we send a dog like the one I just described to the airport and you just have a random citizen walking by and that dog goes for him it's just that's not the dogs that are chosen for that work they have to be stable they have to be appropriate detection work can accommodate some imbalance, some instability. Detection work where the dog is, you know, drug sniffing, bomb sniffing, firearms, that can allow in some cases for um, less stability or biddability with the dog, you know, in social circumstances with other dogs or people. But even still, you don't want that dog redirecting on you as the handler. I mean, you just, there's a lot of aspects to what is, indicated in a case like this that I'm that I told you guys about where what if that dog has something deeply underlying genetic neurological etc that means it takes its life you know too soon like maybe it dies of a you know seizure disorder or an aneurysm or something early because that's part of the um genetic issue that's it that's behind this now you've invested everything into building that dog to a tool for law enforcement only to have it pass away. So these are other factors that you would have to take into consideration that are just peripheral and on top of the most important, which is that that dog needs to be safe in public. Um, and this is not a dog that's safe in public. So 
anyway, that's all I've got for you guys today. Sorry to end on a heavy note. Um, send up some good vibes for the folks that are battling tough cases today. And um, I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me. I always love chatting with you. Um, keep those questions coming. You can email them to april at hope2k9.com or you can comment when we post up for Fix It Friday cues um, each week. And I'll see you next time. All right. Take good care, everybody. Bye.